Welcome to the Wine Show at Home. This is an enormous honour for me and a joy. It's always a joy every time we talk to you. So thank you so much for joining us. It's an honour for me, of course, Joe, and good to see you. And I have to tell people right from the beginning, now we met once or twice since, but we actually met whilst we were making the Wine Show in Portugal. And it was this sort of magical piece of history because you'd made a TV series some years before, hadn't you? I had right there in, in the Porto. We met on the bridge over the door. Oh, it was marvellous. Now, we must tell everybody why we're here. Um, I'm actually, well, I'm, I'm going to show you. I have three copies of the story of wine in the house. So I start with a, a much, a somewhat more youthful looking Hugh Johnson. And um, that's 1991. Do you remember this edition? Yeah, sure. That was just after it was a new book. It was. It's, it's very well thumbed, um, and I've, I've been through it a great deal. I've made no, I haven't scrawled over it, but there are a number of corners of pages turned down. But now we have this, which is beautiful. So tell us, how did this come about? Stephen Sparrow was involved um, because he started the Academy du Vin in Paris many, many years ago. And I think, I believe he sort of sold the rights to the name in various ways. He never sold the um, publishing imprint right. That's how I understand it. So he mentioned to me and to our friend Simon McMurtry that he had this. So we both said, wow. And the idea being to bring back to life a lot of great old texts about wine. And then Simon said, but your, your old text, uh, was published 30 years ago, The Story of Wine, um, is still valid. We made a television series, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, and then there was so much research done for that, infinitely more than we could ever use, that I looked at these papers and I said, there's a book in there. And then he, he came up with this wonderful format, the book that you just showed me, which is sort of a cross between a hardback and a paperback. It's, it's flexible. Yes. And it opens flat, unlike paperbacks. That's true. The, the, proof, everybody. You would like to show, not tell. <laughs> and then my friend, the very good, famous historian, Andrew Roberts, who wrote The Great Life of Napoleon, said that he'd write a foreword to it. And I wrote a new introduction. And Bob's your uncle. You know, I think anybody who's in the business, your life sort of intersects with, with this in some capacity. It'll be something where you wrote an essay or you were doing your diploma and you went back into it. I mean, this has... You, you must have had that sense. This has changed the lives of, of people entering the wine trade now for more than 30 years. But I think that remark about, you know, inspiring new ways of life has come to me most often with the first book I, I, I wrote, which is called Wine, which is now 50, half a century old. It was 1966. But it was, and I'm blowing my own trumpet, I know, it, it sort of took wine to a more popular level, not just demystifying it, but making it sound utterly delicious. But describe for you know, younger people, what was wine writing like before you turned up? The, the main school of wine writing was sort of rather uh, gentry of a certain age, appreciating distinguished bottles, or very, very simplistic. You know, Burgundy is in the different part of France, Bordeaux, and Italy doesn't make much wine at all, or the white, you know, it was like that. Um, or it was sort of deeply referential to history, and this was Louis XIV's favourite wine, and that kind of stuff, you know, completely irrelevant. And what is relevant is what it tastes like, what it's called, where it comes from, how you can enjoy it. I know this is sort of a slightly odd angle, but I only discovered this the other day, you married into a revolutionary wine family through Judy because her family had, after the Gladstone licensing reforms, <clears throat> they had revolutionised wine for the middle classes, hadn't they? Well, Gilby's did, and, and um, I, my wife's maiden name is Grinling, and Grinling's and Gilby's are cousin. There's a very good book, I mean, it was good, it's somewhat dated now, about Victoria wine by Asa Briggs, the, the historian, who'd, who'd written yeah. extensively and had written about the Gilby's and, and their influence in bringing wine to the masses. And then when I suddenly realised there's this connection to you, you did, I mean, not <laughs> only through this, but I mean, through your annual wine guide, which is, how long has that been going for now? I started it, 1977 was the first one, and... Uh, my publisher, James Mitchell, just said, um, all you need 
most people really need to know about wine, could you put in a little book like, like this, like a pocket diary, you see? And I said, my God, having just written the world out of wine, which is rather bigger, so I sat down, I read all I could remember, basically. I read sort of alphabetical order, you know. It, it, it was rather, I thought it was rather sort of a very useful document. It was nicely printed. And then James, at the end, you know, six months later, he said, um, and uh, what about the new edition? I said, oh, but I've written it. You know, that was my pocket wine book. No, no, he said, you've got to update it. So that was a 78 edition. And it's been going on ever since. Now, when you talked before, you were mentioning, you said, you know, wine books maybe talked about the favourite wine of Louis XIV and so on, which wasn't relevant. I mean, one of your skills has been to make sometimes wine from deep history very relevant when you remain are you are you the only person alive who's drunk the was it 1540 what was the vintage no that was extraordinary and i mean because the reason i'm the only person alive is because i was so young when i tasted it and it's a german wine that was in in barrel and it it had remained there since i'm trying to think who was in who was on the, the throne in 1540. so it probably stayed in bottle in barrel for about 200 years and there is still one bottle existing i've been to see it in in Wurzburg in bavaria <laughs> what's the mood like when you you know when that happens well the truth is i mean the 1540 is obviously an unique exaggerated case but here was a very ripe vintage famously so warm that summer so sunny but the energy of the sun that had ripened those grapes was bottled in that wine so i was actually consuming the energy of 400 something years before and there is nothing else conceivable no food no nothing where that is possible You've always sort of tended away from the idea of scoring wines and being analytical in that rather sort of scientific way, which I have to confess has been always one of the reasons I've been such a fan. I would not know how to pick up this glass of wine and say that is worth 97 or 98 points. I simply don't know how you do that. Can you? <laughs> Can you do it? <laughs> well, because you end up with so many variables, you know. Yeah. I mean, what do you, how do you approach a glass of wine when you come and you, you sort of taste it? What do you look for? Uh, there are things that with experience you can tell by the colour and then you sniff. Um, and there's a lot you can tell uh, by the sniff. Um, first of all, actually, how much you like it. Because once in my pocket wine book, I had this, um, a new form. I, I was taking the mickey out of the 100 points system. And I said, the real way to taste wine is like this. The bottom score is one sniff. <laughs> so, then you move up to one sip. If you could... <laughs> right. if, you, if you go to a second sip, it means it isn't entirely disgusting. <laughs> and, and then you go up, eventually you get to a bottle. And then if you want another bottle, of course, then you really, really like it. it you see, hedonism is so important. I mean, it's all pleasure. It's all, why is it all about pleasure? I mean, the pleasure of a, a, a lovely taste is a lovely taste, whether it's wine or food. Mm. Uh, the, um, that is the sort of information contained. You know, there's intellectual pleasure. This is Bordeaux, and there's this part of Bordeaux, and I can compare it with another part of Bordeaux or a different year of the same producer. Um, there's a sort of um, the pleasure of linking it with history. And I mean, as like you are tasting history with an old wine. Um, there's a pleasure of getting drunk if you go that far. <laughs> Rarely, <laughs> uh, almost never. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's why, I mean, as I think I'm explaining in my book, The Story of Wine, mm. it, all the ways in which it, it's, it's come to be what it is, it's sort of got, got its identity in all its different forms. In the modern era, I mean, over the 50 years, you know, 50 plus years since you've been, been writing about wine, what have you seen as the big changes or the, the sort of shifts? It has been a dramatic period of shift, I think, in wine. Oh, oh absolutely. Well, you can, in, in various parts, I mean, the rise of what I've called the new world. People say, well, wine, is that rather dismissive? Why well, the new world? I say, no, because the old world was Europe, where wine was first developed. And when settlers went and colonised new places, they took wine with them. So that was new. So we have the old world and the new world. 
I was the first person, I believe, to take Australian wine seriously in this country. Where, do I look old enough? And <laughs> that was in the sort of early 70s. Um, I went to California before anyone here. And I was probably the second person to take California wine seriously. Uh, and started at something called the Zinfandel Club to taste California wine, which was not being shipped here at all. It was um, we we shipped it privately to people who were interested because the train simply you know said who wants that. Um, so I was very early in the development of, of all these things in, in sort of going to Chile and, and I wrote a book about Chilean wine actually in the seventies. Um, sponsored by the government of Chile. I read it with a great friend called Jan Reed. We tasted it around Chile together. And um, the government looked twice at our book and said, hmm, not sure about this, because they printed our tasting notes. We printed our tasting notes. And some of them said, this is perfectly revolting, <laughs> but still got into print. We were not even asking people what grapes they were growing. Can you believe this? And then, and then along came, well, one of the big influences in this actually was Janice Robinson, because mm. she honed in on this uh, and wrote a book called Grapes, Wine Grapes, and, and uh, sort of talked about the flavours of grapes. You know, we, we knew German wine, Riesling, if you're lucky. Um, but the variety of grapes around, let's say, Italy and so on, nobody was aware of it. I wasn't aware of it. I was talking about places rather than the fruit. It's extraordinary. I mean, that is revolution. Christ. And now when you think last night I had a taste, it was a half bottle tasting. We would take, what, Spotswood's family oh, yeah. estate grown Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah. And it's, it's there, whereas, of course, Ponticane, same vintage and a similar style of wine in some ways, you know, similar yeah. weight and both led by, you know, this is led by Cabernet. No, still no great variety on it at all. It's still very much in the old world. Because it, because it has to be in Bordeaux, really. <laughs> but actually, I mean, you mentioned half bottles. I'm glad you do because there aren't enough, I think. Um, the, to get really good wine, I mean, that Spotswood is a lovely, lovely wine. Uh, to get that in a half bottle, you're jolly lucky because... Um, and I suppose it costs almost as much to bottle a half bottle as it does a bottle, and not a great deal of saving. And so people look at the price of a half bottle and they say, well, it's not half price, is it? Which is a shame, because I'd love to have more half bottles and I could sort of taste more different ones. <laughs> I have a friend, and he, he's, he's always lived on his own, and he said if he'd had his time again, he would have spent all his money on half bottles and magnums. He said, I'm either <laughs> drinking alone or having a party. And I said, <laughs> those will be the two formats. And I think we don't drink enough magnums and half bottles, really. What Queen Anne said when she was first presented, presented with a turkey, she said it's too much for one, but not enough for two. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, uh, this is a really, you must be a store of these anecdotes. I hope that they sort of, well, most of them are, most of them are tucked away in here, aren't they? Oh, but, are, yes. and one area we which has been transformed, and you've written about it in history, and I think more modernly, is the world of English wine. Um, obviously oh, you, yes. You and lived in England. I mean, that's transformed, hasn't it? The most exciting thing currently to me is what's happening in the English wine. I mean, I was as sceptical as everyone else 20 years ago, and there were one or two, and then I remember in about 1993 or four. Ridgeview was big. Mike Roberts started Ridgeview, and we bought some for the Sunday Times Wine Club and gave it a, um, a different label, called it South Ridge. And, and, and uh, I, but that was a big boost to, to that company at that moment because somebody was prepared to buy a thousand bottles for the fruit. It was quite something. It was wonderful. I mean, I had the last bottle not many years ago. It was I could not believe that England was making something seriously comparable with champagne. And, of course, years later now, I think several of our English wines are actually better than almost any champagne, in a different style, in a style I really like. Yes, although there are some English winemakers who look for a more champagne style, you know, with sort of they use the yeast in a champagne way to have that extra dimension of flavour, and others who don't, who prefer the sort of orchard fruit style, uh, and they're both valid, I think. And it comes back in a way to judging wine and point systems and everything else. 
Because I always say that Burgundy can't make, make better Bordeaux, and Bordeaux can't make better Burgundy. And what is better? You know, if one is distinct and good in itself, um, that's it. That's your pleasure. Within your career, who have been the people who've been most fascinating? Has it been people within the wine world or those you've met around the periphery? Well, my first boss, really, um, who was André Simon, who was a Frenchman, who uh, was... Um, he was 60 years older than me. I went to interview him for a magazine and he wrote beautifully about wine in a way that nobody would now, nobody would dare to practically because it was all comparisons with, with people. I mean, the, he, and he was really good at it. When he said that this wine was like an old lady, he said, well, yes, mm, I can't say what you mean. <laughs> you, you, you can't do that now for all sorts of reasons. <laughs> I wonder if we're seeing sort of fringes of it. Matthew Dukes, I'm great friends with, we had lunch earlier on this week and he described a wine and, and where everybody was just sort of listening to the description. And then he suddenly said, there is something about this that is raw and vampiric. And suddenly we got it. And he said, it's Darcy Bustle with a flick knife. Ah, oh, they're good. <laughs> And it did just capture this thing. And I think that sense of vampiric was always quite useful. And it's one of those words I do hope I can get to use it. And I'll have to copyright him every time. But, but, but you know, we should be bolder about metaphors. I used to be mad keen on jazz. And I would compare different wines to different trumpet soloists or something, you know. People must ask you, I'd love to write about wine. What do you tend to, what's your advice to them? Is it run for the hills? Well, people say, I'd love to write about wine, about everything else. And I'd say, well, actually, do you do it? It's all very, all very well saying, I'd love to do something, but unless you do it, it doesn't happen. But first of all, the, the rule for me, for any writer, is think of the reader. Far more than even thinking about the subject, it's that you're talking to somebody. First aim has got to be, you are writing to, I'm, I'm writing to you, you're my friend, and you who I'm talking to. Um, so if you, if you write like, as you would write a letter, I know letters have almost disappeared these days, but um, that kind of one-to-one uh, -one business, that, that, that tends to work. It certainly does. Well, look, Hugh, thank you so much. This is a letter to the world of wine. I mean, I suppose that's one way we could go and describe it. It is um, it's, it's a, a long-running love letter to the history of wine, the story of wine itself. And oh, thank you so much for republishing it again, um, because, I, you know, it's, well, it, it's given me a great deal of pleasure since 1991, which was when I first got it. So it's sort of catching up there. Everybody must go and buy this. So, yeah. so it's available through the Academy Divan Wine Library, um, I won't deal with the topic of coin because it's it's just good value at yes. the price. I think that's fair. At whatever price. Whatever price. Hugh, I do hope we get to go and see each other again very soon. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye.